Welcome to everyone here today. I'm looking forward to talking to this great big audience from around the world, and I hope you'll find some of the things I'm talking about interesting. I'll be talking about big telescopes like the one you can see behind me here, which is the Giant Magellan Telescope. So let me go to share my slides, and you can see some of the pictures that I'll be able to share with you. Okay, so I hope you can uh, see the picture there. We're going to be exploring the universe with giant new telescopes. And the picture you can see there is an engineering drawing of the giant Magellan telescope, the one you can see in the background of my image. But let's start not with the giant new telescopes of tomorrow, but with the very first telescope that was used to look at the sky. This is Galileo's telescope. Galileo was an Italian astronomer who was the very first person to use a telescope to look at the sky. And that was just over 400 years ago in 1609. Now his telescope was very small. The lens on the end of the telescope was only about 37 millimeters across. So just a bit bigger than the gap between my fingers there. And he used it to study the phases of Venus, to discover the moons of Jupiter, and to see craters on the moon. Now, all of those things are great and wonderful, and we still look at them with our telescopes, but we're beginning to look further and further out into the universe. So here's a telescope that I've used a lot during my research. This is the Anglo-Australian Telescope. It's at a place called Siding Spring Observatory. You can see it there on the right, and it lives in that big white dome. And it's a beautiful place. It's a national park uh, on the edge of an old volcano. About 20 million years ago, this site was a volcano. Now it's very quiet and a beautiful national park. Now, the Anglo-Australian telescope is a four meter telescope. And I'll be talking about the sizes of telescopes and I'll be saying so many meters. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the size of the mirror or the dish with which the light or the radio waves is being collected. And why does that matter? Why is that the important thing to talk about? Well, it's because the bigger the dish or the mirror, the more light you collect. And it's just like, imagine you go out into the rain with a big bowl and a small bowl. The small bowl will only collect a little bit of rain and the big bowl will collect a lot of rain. In the same way, a big dish or a big mirror collects a lot of light. And that helps you to see faint things and small things and far away things. So this telescope is a typical telescope used by um, professional astronomers. It's quite a big one. It's four meters in diameter. So the main mirror is about two and a bit times as big as a tall person. Now, that's good, but in fact, the biggest telescopes in the world today are significantly bigger than that. Here's a telescope that's an eight meter telescope. So this telescope is the Gemini North Telescope on the island, the big island of Hawaii. And it's sitting on top of a mountain there. And it's got a, a mirror that's eight meters across. So it can catch, in fact, four times as much light as the telescope I showed you before. Now, one of the things that you'll see <clears throat> is that astronomers like putting their telescopes on the tops of mountains. And the reason for that is that you want to get as high as you can. You want to have nice clear skies. You want to have as little cloud or water vapor in the atmosphere above you as possible. And you'd also like to have nice still atmosphere. And if you're on top of a mountain, most of those things are usually found. Now, of course, <clears throat> you want to make that mountain somewhere that's nice and dry and not too cloudy. And the big island of Hawaii has a tall volcano called Mauna Kea, which meets all those conditions. And so there's a lot of telescopes on Mauna Kea. Another place that astronomers put their big telescopes is in Chile, in the Atacama Desert. This is in the foothills of the Andes Mountains. So again, it's very high but it's also very dry, it hardly ever rains in the Atacama. And so it's a great place to put a big telescope because there's almost never any clouds there, which is great. 
Let's look then at all different sorts of telescopes. This diagram shows pictures of, a, of the mirrors belonging to a whole different set of optical telescopes. Some of them from long ago, some of them were built as before 1900, and some of them are the big giant ones I'll be talking about in this session. Now, as I said before, bigger telescopes are better because firstly, you collect more light, so you can see fainter things. Secondly, you can make sharper pictures with a bigger mirror, and so you can see smaller things. Now, since far away things are generally both smaller and fainter, bigger telescopes are very helpful for seeing things that are further away. So the history of astronomy, which is all about discovering new things, is all about bigger and bigger telescopes. Now, you can see how big some of these telescopes are. Galileo's telescope is so small that it's smaller than the smallest dot on this diagram here. If you look at the bottom, you can see there's a tennis court and a basketball court in the diagram, just to give you an idea of how big some of these telescopes are. So the first telescope I showed you, the Anglo-Australian telescope, is about the size of these two telescopes. If you can see my mouse there, then those two telescopes are about the size. But the ones I'll be talking about in this talk are these three giants over on the right-hand side. Down at the bottom right, you can see the giant Magellan telescope, which is composed of seven mirrors, each mirror eight meters across. So the whole width of the mirror is about 25 meters across. So for those of you who remember the size of an Olympic swimming pool, that's about the short width of an Olympic swimming pool. The one at top right is called the 30 meter telescope and you won't be surprised to learn that it's actually 30 meters across. It's made up not of a few big mirrors, but lots of small mirrors. And the same is true of the biggest giant mirror of them all, the one belonging to the European Extremely Large Telescope. That's 39 meters across and it's made up of nearly a thousand small mirrors, all making one giant mirror that's bigger than a basketball court. These are enormous telescopes. Let me give you an idea of just how big they are. Here's a picture taken from a, a magazine story about these um, telescopes, showing the three telescopes side by side. The giant Magellan telescope on the left, the 30 meter telescope in the middle, and the European extremely large telescope on the right. And you can see, if you look very closely, there's a person and a couple of cars in each of these pictures. See that tiny little black dot there? That is a person. That's a person. And that's a person. These are enormous, enormous telescopes. And they will allow us to do some quite extraordinary things. So to get an idea of how big those are, oh, before I go on, I should say where they are. The little pictures of the Earth on each one of these show where they are. The giant Magellan telescope is going to be in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. It's going to be at a site called Las Campanas Observatory, which has been used for over 50 years now for uh, observing. The 30 meter telescope is going to be on the big island of Hawaii, the same place as the second telescope I showed you on top of Mauna Kea. So it's out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in the Northern Hemisphere. And the European Extremely Large Telescope is actually going to be quite close to the Giant Magellan Telescope, also in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So two of these telescopes are in the south and one is in the north and between them, they'll cover the whole sky. <clears throat> so here's a picture of the Giant Magellan Telescope. You can see again, a couple of pictures of cars there which show you just how big it is. In fact, the giant Magellan telescope is about as tall as the space shuttle. It's an enormous building, nearly 65 meters from the bottom to the top of the dome. Now I call it a dome, but you can see it's not round like an ordinary telescope dome. In fact, it's more sort of square or rectangular. And instead of uh, opening along a slit, it actually slides apart. You can see the two halves of the dome, pulled apart on their tracks to show the, some of the mirrors inside. 
and you're peeking inside there to see some of the seven mirrors that make up the entire telescope. And around and about, you can see other buildings which are needed to help support the telescope. Some of those buildings are used to put the shiny aluminium surface on the mirrors. Others are used for people to control the telescope. So you can see the telescope is not just one big building, but in fact, a whole complex of buildings needed to run the observatory. On the right-hand side, you can see a cutaway of the giant Magellan telescope. Again, you can see a couple of people in this picture for scale. There's one there, one down on the floor of the, of the building. And you can see the seven mirrors. And then above them, a, a second set of mirrors, which is the light comes in at the top here, bounces off these mirrors, goes up to these mirrors, and then down through the middle of the main mirror to the instruments, which are actually underneath the main mirror. So the light bounces around inside the telescope, is concentrated down and focused onto the instruments which actually take the pictures for the spectra for the telescope. Okay, so here's another picture showing all seven mirrors of the giant Magellan telescope. Now I'm mostly showing you this telescope because this is one that I've been involved in. I've been helping to build this telescope for more than 15 years now takes a long time to build these telescopes. They cost a lot of money. This telescope costs around about $2 billion, and it's the cheapest of the telescopes I'll be talking about today. All the others cost more than $2 billion. These are very big projects. They involve thousands of people and will be used by tens of thousands of astronomers around the world. So here's a picture showing all these different telescopes next to each other. Here are four eight meter telescopes on the far left, the very large telescope belonging to the European Southern Observatory. And their new telescope, the European Extremely, oops, Extremely Large Telescope, which is here, this big one right here. Then we've got the two Keck telescopes, which are the two of the largest telescopes in existence right now. And they've got mirrors which are 10 meters across and they're on Mauna Kea and they'll be next to the 30 meter telescope, which is here. You've got some other big telescopes in Spain and Japan and in South Africa. And then on the far right, you've got the giant Magellan telescope. Now, to give you an idea of how big these are, if you look down here, you can see the European extremely large telescope next to the Sydney Opera House. And you can see that it's actually considerably taller and nearly as wide as the Opera House. It's a very big building indeed. Here's a picture I took when I visited it. They're digging the foundations for this telescope and pouring in the concrete to make them right now. This is a picture showing some people sitting in the base. So these people are are down underneath the building you can see in the other pictures in the foundations and the building will be built on top of this. And as you can see, it's very large indeed. All right, I've been talking up till now about optical telescopes, telescopes that look at ordinary visible light, the same light that you and I can see with our eyes. They often sometimes also work in the infrared or a little way into the ultraviolet, but basically they're looking at fairly ordinary light. But there are also some big telescopes being built which work with radio waves. Radio waves are another form of light or electromagnetic radiation as we call it. They look quite different. Instead of having mirrors, they have metal dishes, but they work the same way. The metal dish concentrates the radio waves onto a focus where there are instruments which take images or do other things to analyze the data. But one big difference with many radio dishes, instead of having a single dish, they can actually combine lots of dishes together to make a telescope that's effectively as big as the biggest gap between the dishes. So if you look at the picture at the bottom right here, we're looking at the very large array in New Mexico, or an American radio telescope, and you can see a Y-shape arrangement of small dishes, which together make up a giant radio telescope as big as the whole Y shape. So that's a, a trick that you can do with radio telescopes. It's not very easy to do with ordinary visible telescopes. You can make them very big indeed. And the biggest of all of these new radio telescopes is something called the square kilometer array. And it's called that because it's collecting area 
is intended to be one square kilometer. In other words, the total area of collecting will cover a whole square kilometer, one kilometer on a side. Now, this picture shows some of the dishes of the square kilometer array uh, in an artist's impression with the um, galaxy in the background. You can see the Milky Way over the horizon there. But this picture is actually a bit of a cheat. And the reason for that is because all these different types of dishes aren't actually going to be in the same place. You can see three different types of dishes there. The big ones on the left, into sort of medium sized one in the middle there. And then these weird spiky little things sitting on the ground, which are in fact another sort of radio dish. And these dishes are in different places. The ones on the left are going to be built in South Africa. And they're going to be looking at uh, relatively short wavelength radio waves. And they're an ordinary dish and they collect the light in that funny little uh, thing that sits above the main dish. And there'll be up to of order a thousand of these dishes making up this giant square kilometer array. But if you want to measure wavelengths that are much longer than that, very long radio wavelengths, then you need a different sort of dish. And instead of having a, a, an ordinary dish, uh, what you need are these strange little aerials that sit on the ground in the right-hand picture. And those will be located in Australia, out in Western Australia, out in the middle of the desert. And they'll sit next to the other dishes you can see in the background there, which are part of Australia's Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Telescope. And between them, all of these different systems will make up the overall Square Kilometre Array. And it'll be incredibly powerful because it'll be able to take pictures like this. This picture is in fact a picture of our galaxy, but not in ordinary light. So it's not like this picture here, which is the one that you and I see if we look up at the Milky Way and we see the stars and the dark clouds and all the rest. No, this is a picture taken if our eyes worked at radio wavelengths. And what you can see here is all the different supernova remnants and magnetic filaments and all the other structures that are emitting radio waves in our galaxy. It looks completely different. And that's why it's important to have different sorts of telescopes because with different sorts of telescopes, you see the sky in very different ways and you learn about very different sorts of events. Now, as well as radio telescopes, we can also put telescopes in space. Here are two of the most famous telescopes, one that's already operating, the Hubble Space Telescope, two pictures of that on the left. That's a telescope working at uh, optical, near infrared and near ultraviolet wavelengths. And it's got a two and a half meter mirror inside it. The Hubble Space Telescope is orbiting the Earth about 550 kilometers up, and it goes around the Earth about every 95 minutes. And it's been up there doing that for the last 30 years. It was launched in 1990. And it was serviced and repaired and fixed and replaced and looked after by five different missions with the space shuttle that went up to visit it. Now, the space shuttle no longer works. So Hubble can't be repaired anymore. And so one day it will break. We hope it isn't soon, but one day it will fail. And it'll be replaced by the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the telescope on the right. The James Webb Space Telescope works mainly at infrared wavelengths. <clears throat> and its mirror, which is the large gold hexagon you can see in the middle there, is in fact six and a half meters across. So it's uh, more than twice the size of Hubble. So it's a much bigger mirror than Hubble. Now, Hubble cost about $5 billion to build, the James Webb Space Telescope cost nearly $9 billion to build. So these are incredibly expensive telescopes. Whereas Hubble is only 550 kilometers above our heads, orbiting the Earth every 95 minutes, James Webb is going to go far, far away, one and a half million kilometers away, somewhere out uh, be, uh, about uh, between the Earth and the Moon. And it will uh, sit out there quietly for its up to 10 years of operating life. <clears throat> now, the funny thing you see below the gold mirror there, the layers of silvery looking foil, those are in fact a sun shield because 
The James Webb telescope needs to be shielded from the sun. The Hubble can use the Earth's shadow to shield it from the sun, but James Webb can't do that. So it has a special sun shield to keep it in the shadow and keep it safe and not let it get too hot. What can you do with James Webb? Well, you'll be able to take some of the sharpest pictures ever. Because James Webb's not looking through the atmosphere, it can take very sharp pictures at infrared wavelengths, and it'll be used to take pictures like these of very complex regions of our galaxy, which have got lots of structure in them, many stars all crowded closely together. It'll be able to separate those out and see them individually. It'll also be able to see galaxies very far away when the very first stars were being born in our universe more than 13 billion years ago. So it's gonna be incredibly powerful when it's launched next year in 2021. Finally, the last telescope I want to tell you about is this one. It doesn't look much like a telescope at all, really. And that's because it's not looking at electromagnetic waves. It's not looking at radio waves or light or even X-rays. This is looking at gravitational waves. And these are a completely different sort of wave. They're not like light at all. These are actually little stretches of space and time. And they're produced by when very, very heavy things um, move around each other. And in particular, very heavy things we're thinking of here are black holes, giant black holes out in the universe, weighing often many times the mass of our sun, which are orbiting around each other and gradually losing energy, giving off gravitational waves as they get closer and closer, spiraling in and finally merge to make a giant bigger black hole and give off a huge amount of energy, all in a burst. And that burst of energy speeds across the universe at the speed of light and is picked up by this LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. There's two of these LIGO stations in America, about 3,000 kilometers apart, another one in Europe, another one in Japan, and another one being built in India. And we hope one day there might be one in Australia as well. Now, LIGO is amazing because it can do extraordinary things. It is able to pick up distortions in space and time that are smaller than the size of a proton, smaller than the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. That's equivalent to an optical telescope being able to see a human hair at the distance of the nearest stars. This is an incredible engineering feat, but it what enables us to be able to see black holes merging in the universe. Here's an artist's impression of two black holes with gas swirling around them as the two black holes move around each other and get closer and closer to merging into a single giant black hole. These are all the different telescopes we're going to have soon. In the next 10 years, we're going to have giant telescopes working at optical and infrared wavelengths on the ground. And these will be between 25 and 39 meters in diameter. We're going to have a spectacular radio telescope, the Square Kilometer Array, which has got a collecting area of one square kilometer and will be able to see radio waves across the whole width of the universe all the way back to the Big Bang. We'll have the James Webb Space Telescope out orbiting the Earth far, far from us and looking at the whole universe with exquisite precision, able to detect the faintest little infrared uh, signals across the universe. And finally, we'll have gravitational observatories like LIGO picking up black holes and neutron stars and other exotic objects as they dance around each other before merging. It's going to be a really exciting time these next 10 years. And so young people like you are going to have a wonderful time. There's going to be discovery after discovery of all sorts of exciting things that we can't even imagine right now. I hope you really enjoy it because I'm looking forward to it too. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm now happy to uh, take some questions.